go ahead and make decisions about what we're going to do on the farm, we try to think, well, how does this fit into the system that we already have? What uh, multiple benefits would any decision make? Uh, so it wasn't just a question of are we going to have a buffer. We knew we had to have a buffer, but um, since we were going to do that, we were going to have that physical landscape on the farm, um, we decided how can we do it in such a way that would provide a benefit to the whole system of our farm. Beneficial insects, even though we didn't know a lot about them, we wanted to try to encourage them. And so we worked with uh, Matt O'Neill and some of his graduate students to come up with uh, different uh, control, which was big blue stem, and a couple different type of mixes on our border. And that's what that poster is about. So this mix here is the only one that has persisted. And it looks like it's dominated right now by cut plant. And you'll notice, in, in, if, it, if you're really quiet, you can actually hear the bees here. Um, they utilize it a lot. As time goes on throughout the season, there will be other dominant flowers in here. So this mix from the Michigan study um, was supposed to be attractive to beneficial insects and have flowering throughout the season. So I liked that a lot because uh, here on the farm, our flowering crop plants are compressed into a particular time period throughout the year that doesn't, I don't think, provide enough food for pollinators and um, habitat for beneficial insects. I asked my neighbors after we moved in a, a little early, I said, if I ever wanted to uh, long-term lease or buy some land around and expand, you know, what, what, what would you think of that? He's like, well, you should tear that timber down first. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you know, I, I knew that having that undisturbed area on this farm was just as important as the organic matter content of my soils and my crop rotation. And I might not have been able to go ahead and articulate why that was, but I think now that I've had... Um, some research done here on the farm. If you look at the two ways that the, bee, that the pollinators were collected, and you look at the four top species that are pollinating our crops, they're all ground dwellers. And so having all that undisturbed ground, I think, has been one key factor in having such a robust pollinator population here. at my cover crop mix there. I try to plant a row of long flowering flowers along the edge. I was talking to the good doctors here before. I said, uh, I really like the look of these zinnias. They're attractive. They flower all the way till it frosts. But I said, I don't really believe that pollinators are using them very much. And they let me in on the secret. Uh, since they're so cultivated, and they've been bred for showiness, they're not as useful for food for pollinators. So I'm going to have to start looking at some other, uh, maybe better flowers to plant. On the south side of the farm, we have uh, a lot of creeping charley around our perennial beds. We made a decision to leave it because it flowers very early and we noticed that um, it was very used by pollinators. So we just edged those perennial beds, we let the creeping charlie take over. I don't mind it, it's actually a very attractive plant. I don't know why people are so opposed to it, I guess because we have this sense that the English lawn is the model of perfection but it's not very useful to pollinators or anything else, really. So we've done that, and then we've got a long row, about over 100 foot of forsythia along the road, and that does flower very early. So that's between the forsythia and the creeping charlie, we do have some ability to feed pollinators early in the season. 
So I'm curious about what you actually, the pests you find yourself treating for. You didn't need to get after the aphids in the willows, but some things you treat. And there's some things I treat um, because I can treat them very effectively and efficiently. There's some things I treat because I have to save a crop. Generally, I do very little treatment. So I spend about maybe $80 a year on organic pesticides, which means I'll buy a little bit of Bacillus thuringiensis, which I use on my brassicas for the larva of the imported cabbage looper butterfly, which I, I was gonna say there's probably a lot of them working. That's because that's my greens field there. I don't see them. When the sun comes out, they'll be there. Well, there's there's a couple. You see a couple over there. Yeah. And I, I generally spray the bacteria once or twice a week, depending on how many butterflies I see working. Um, and then when I'm harvesting summer squash, I carry a little bottle of soapy water in my pocket. I might uh, squirt some hatch uh, squash bugs when, yeah. I'm, when I'm working. I try to keep the plants trimmed and airy. Uh, once in a while, I might spray pyrethrin, which is kind of my lap. It, it's, a, it's pretty effective as a contact, pushed in cucumber beetles. I mix a little soapy water, uh, a little pyrethrin, and uh, I did spray my cucumbers once this year. So, but other than that, I really I don't do a lot of insect control. If I have a, a really a bad outbreak and I can't physically control it, you know, by removing it. Uh, I might spray my return, but, um, you know, for all our cucurbits, I, we plant them under row cover. Um, so by the time we take those off, the plants are really strong. They're not overwhelmed by the insect populations we have. They usually die due to vine borer, especially when it's dry or like this. But I always get a crop. I do succession planting, so once they do become overwhelmed, they have a new crop starting. Um, I do a pretty extensive crop rotation. I do a lot of cover cropping, uh, which I, I till back into the soil. So with all of those tools, I, I, I generally don't have a lot of problems. The, the, the extremes in the environment have really been harmful, I think, for pest populations. Uh, it's given some pests really uh, advantages to, you know, to ramp up their populations quite fast as they might not normally do. So. Uh, buckwheat I like because it's, you know, it's an attractive plant. It's really succulent. It's easy to till back in. But you know, it's it's seeding in 28 days. So by the time I get get it planted and all, you know, pretty soon I got to get it mowed. I, I, mean, I got to plant something else there, otherwise I'm going to have a lot of seed in my field. So I'm really excited about this. It doesn't seed this far north, so you never have to worry about it being a weed problem in your field. And we've got the sun hinge coming up. I don't know, you know, how it's going to, how, how it can mow it, whether it's viney, how succulent the stems are going to be. Uh, how tall it's going to get. Um, the, one of the biggest drawbacks to planting it in, the, in Iowa is the seed availability. Uh, there's only a few places in the United States, Texas and Florida, southern Texas and Florida, where you can actually grow it. So Hawaii is one place where seed's coming from now. The University of Hawaii's uh, got seed for sale. Um, if it becomes popular, I'm hoping that maybe there will be some more continental uh, U.S. farmers growing it for seed. Um, it's not toxic to poultry or livestock, uh, so that's good. Some of my covers are. One thing I find it particularly attractive for this farm is I've got root rot nematode. If I uh, don't, if I rotate too short my carrots, sometimes I get problems. This field, particularly up on that side of the field, I've got nematode problems. Uh, really bad on the carrots a couple years ago. Um, 
This does not host rotten nematode at all, so it should really bring the populations down. Oh, we'll go. Let's go to it. Yeah. <laughs> so this was planted June 28th, and we did not have any rain, a measurable rain on this, for at least three or four weeks. Hmm. So all this came up after tillage, after two times tilling it. No rain for three, four weeks. I like that because in the summer you can't always count on a timely rain for cover crops. Buckwheat's the same way. It does not take a lot of moisture to get buckwheat out of the ground and grow. You notice then on the on that 21st we got some rain and there's a lot of uh, four, five, six inch plants. It's, it's coming up. Uh, it waited. So it's filling itself in a little bit. Whether it'll get, stay ahead of the weeds or not, I don't know. This was broadcast by hand and then disced in with a light disc, almost straight disc. Which sounds a little bit old fashioned, but I can do a really good job of you know, getting that spread out evenly and disc in about the same depth. And, and I can get a really a good solid stand generally. So I don't think these patches were particularly because of the way it was uh, planted. I think it was because we had a lack of rain. Uh, if we would have got an inch more between the 28th of uh, June and the July 21st, I think this would be pretty solid. Well, almost all my cover crops get tilled back in. And generally I mow, I mow and I till right away. So it's, you know, it's, Joe you. Yeah, and then so it's you. succulent and it gets, but you know, every crop is different. If it starts to get stemmy, I'll probably cut it and till it in. Um, I know it's not gonna flower, so I don't have to worry about that. If the, you know, if it starts, uh, diminishing and weeds start coming up, I'll till it in. Once I see weeds starting to seed, I cut it. So, um, I don't like, you know, I don't like having a big weed seed bank. So the cover crop really, I really over plant. Is it an expensive seed? It is expensive. I think, I think on the commercial market, it's like $6 a pound, right? Wow. So yeah, there's, no, there's not seed available. There really isn't. So you know, to make this practical, you would have to bring that seed cost down considerably, which means we'd have to have an a industry in Texas or Florida to produce it. But if there's a demand for it and it's a good, you know, it works good, um, I don't see any reason why people wouldn't grow it. Did you have to treat it for, for it to fix the nitrogen then? I never do any any uh, inoculations for legumes. Okay. And I don't know whether that's a dumb on my part or not, but uh, I never had a really a problem that I know of. Sure. Uh, we did some yield data studies with peas here this year, and I'll be able to compare that with some other farms. So if I see a drag, maybe I should think about that. But for the cover crops, I, I, I don't. Like in the in the spring, I, I tried to do chickling vetch, which is a, a relatively new type of vetch, but it'll fix it'll fix over 100 pounds of nitrogen in a very short amount of time too. So that is that is not good for livestock. Right?